Welcome to Good Game Pocket Edition, our snack science show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. Coming up in the show, we're going to slice into Metal Gear Rising Revengeance and examine its inside. <laughs> Plus, Goose takes us along to a Zelda Symphony concert. But first, let's round up the games that we played this week, Hex, and let's start with Antichamber, the highly acclaimed indie title that will madden your brain. Antichamber is a surreal first-person puzzler for PC, created by Melbourne-based indie developer Alexander Bruce. It's a mind-bending obstacle course of rooms that are purposely designed to confuse and deceive. Where am I going? Until you figure out the aha solution that allows you to progress. What's, what's that mean? And just when you feel the slightest bit of accomplishment, oh, connect four, oh, you walk into another puzzle that will completely stump you, sometimes forcing you to give up and try another maze direction. Yes, nothing is as it seems. Deciphering how you're meant to interact with the world is half the challenge, and that means endless trial and error. Even looking in one direction can change the design of the room behind you. Confusion reigns! In fact, I dreaded loading it up each time just because of that relentless confusion and assault on your senses. Well, it just goes against everything we've been conditioned to, and that can be quite intense. It's akin to writing with your left hand, you know, or, or putting on your underpants in the dark, or trying to use the new version of iTunes. I don't know how they made the program even worse. Where's the sidebar? This game should come with headache tablets and a little pillow that you can cry into at night. <laughs> it really should. I mean, you will lie awake at night just seeing these empty spaces in your head and, and just turning things around like some kind of MC Escher nightmare. Mm. It's crazy stuff, and so many of these rooms felt like they've been ripped from some traumatic childhood <laughs> dream I had. It's a real shame because you can tell there's such great ideas here and that they've been spawned from such a brilliant mind, but when they're executed in a way that make you not want to play the game, it's it's upsetting. I gave it a six. Yeah, it's a really intense game to play. Ugh. I feel sick. I gave it seven and a half. I think it's very cool. Now onto another indie game we reviewed. No time to explain. This is a side-scrolling platformer with an amusing premise. Your future self has come back to warn you of something of great importance, but is attacked by a giant claw before he can finish his sentence, leaving you in possession of a futuristic gun that you use to propel yourself around and shoot at stuff. The developer has called this a comedy platformer, but I'm not sure if it really lives up to either of those labels. There are some pretty critical flaws here, mostly in the controls. Just propelling yourself around with the mouse and keyboard is quite fiddly, and it, it, it was just a little bit too hard. When there's so much other stuff to kill you, you want that to be a little bit easier. Yeah, look, the whole game lacks polish, really, but I did find it quite humorous. It's so random, and I loved all the hats. Ooh, a hat! I got many a chuckle from my future self's dying words. My ribs are in my eyes! Again, it's got some great ideas, but here the execution is just too clumsy to make it worthwhile, so I gave it four and a half. Yeah, it's trying to nail down on that Super Meat Boy mentality where it's one more go, one more go, one more go, but those controls were just too fiddly for me to want to have that extra go, so I gave it four. Well, we're all rounded up. Time to catch up with Goose. Good game. The Zelda series contains some of the most iconic video game music of all time, and now a team of talented producers are taking it to the next level. They're combining some of the most loved tunes into an original four-movement symphony. Zelda was really kind of the first game that just completely struck my imagination and sort of set it on fire. I had that melody just stuck in my head that, that from the original game. I would play out my own little fantasies with that theme music going. And in a way, I was hearing it not the way it was in the game, but hearing it with a full orchestra. We were able to work directly with uh, Kondo San, and you know, Chad and I would conceptualize the pieces. I would, I would kind of work with him on the narrative and then he would then go and do the music uh, and, and the notation and, and kind of figure out the orchestration. We'd throw it to Koji Kondo. Um, he would tell us what he liked and what he didn't like. Fortunately, he never really returned a whole lot of notes, just, just lots of thumbs up. What 
I've always wanted to do is create a show that everything's on beat. You know, it's, it's, on a, it's on a train and it's on a click so that everything is just working together. So there's no wasted um, movements or any wasted video. And it's just beautifully orchestrated to the visuals. So what are some of the big differences producing a concert about video game music opposed to one about classical music? Obviously, the, the artist is the game itself. Um, so uh, unlike a Pavarotti or the three tenors, they're the artists and you focus on them, but really the, the, the focus is on the visuals of the game and of course the, the musicians. So um, that was, that's really the biggest difference in, and how does that relate to the fans? It's, it's such a great experience to go to different cities and work with the great orchestras of those cities. And each, each performance has a different flavor because there's a, a different group of musicians. The Sydney Symphony, they're a family, they play together all, all the time. Sun Yi, the concertmaster, has the most heart-wrenchingly beautiful tone as well. So that's some of the, the solos, the violin solos, some of the great melodies from, from the Zelda franchise under his fingers, absolutely stunning. It always surprises the orchestra. They think, oh, video game, oh, this is, they, they, they have some preconceived notions. But then when they see the, the largesse, the, the huge scope of this music and uh, the combination of, of Kondo San and Chad's work, they, the orchestra has a, has a really fun time because it's difficult music. It's not easy. And it gives them a really a great chance to show off their instrument. Games and, and uh, gameplay and music, they go hand in hand. You know, it's, uh, it's a soundtrack of my generation. Listening to music now, it's, uh, we've taken it one step further and kind of, I think what we've done is, what everyone imagined and what they dreamed uh, the game's music could be is what we're actually doing now with the full orchestra and the choir. Exposing our younger fans to the orchestra in this way, we don't dumb the music down. The blood, sweat and tears that you're hearing and seeing is real human beings doing it there in the moment. What's so neat about the fans coming into this, this, this concert hall tonight, they all have their own experience with these games. It sort of lines up with certain moments in their life. I can think about where I was when I was playing Link to the Past and what was going on in my life at that time. And so all these people have all these memories and they're getting to re-experience this nostalgia together. It just creates this bond that you just don't get anywhere else. Good game. Thanks, Goose. Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is the latest spin-off in the Metal Gear franchise, which sees the return of ninja cyborg hero Raiden. In the year of 2018, four years after Guns of the Patriots, cyborg technology is everywhere. While the larger private military companies have been destroyed, smaller rogue and criminal groups using cyborg tech for their own gain are rampant. Enter our hero, Cyborg Ninja Raiden, who fans will recognise from Metal Gear 2 and 4 with flowing locks and a smoky eye any girl would envy, not to mention a flair for the dramatic. I mean, he is nothing short of fabulous, Bardo. Combat is fast, combo-based swordplay, but it's far from a button masher as there's loads of different aspects to the action, broken up with probably your most powerful attack, blade mode, which I like to call slow-mo slice and dice. Yeah, it's basically bullet time with a sword. Slow-mo slice and dice can also be used to jump from missile to missile like stepping stones to perform a mid-air copter takedown. Brilliant. I thought so. There's also some fancy customizations you can make to his suit. Oh, I want a robot suit so bad, Hex. New weapons to unlock and skills to learn. And how you spend your points is all depending on how crazy you want to get with your fight style. Plus, it has all the signature touches that no Metal Gear game could be without, such as its highly advanced stealth techniques. I got 
this is a game that doesn't take itself too seriously, which I think is fantastic. I have to say though, I did really like the way the story developed. I mean, dialogue does start off really one dimensional. I will kill him, no, don't do it. Uh, but later on, once Raiden starts to face some pretty intense inner turmoil over his true nature, his moral obligations and his tortured past, the whole human versus AI conflict becomes really engaging, particularly with the introduction of his AI companion. Altering the course of mankind is not above my divine directives. I guess that's a relief. Yes, he was wonderfully philosophical for a robot dog. Better than this kid whose accent was so thick that even his subtitles needed subtitles. They pack us all a big up dirty container. Next thing we know, we're here at the Jumbi Lab. Final thoughts, Bajo? I think there'll be a lot of Metal Gear fans who just won't like this at all, but there is a lot to like in this game, it's just different, so I'm giving it 8 out of 10. But the more I played of this, the more I got into it, and you know, I don't have decades of snake-loving Metal Gear fandom behind me the way some might, but as a spin-off, this was a 9 out of 10 for me. Adios, amigos. Well, that was quick. Another tightly packed episode of Pocket Edition. Yes, very concise. We'll be back on Tuesday at 8.30 for a regular full-length episode of Good Game. We're going to be checking out Crisis 3. Cycle down. And then Persona 4 for the Vita. Let it go! Ah! And we're back here again on Saturday with another Pocket Edition. Hmm. Well, until then, may all your games come with cloth maps. Marge out. <laughs> X out. Cloth maps.